just want to make sure. The yeah, off yeah. We'll we'll let these guys get settled. Okay. Take your time. We're just coming back from recess, so just get get comfortable. Fifteen minutes you get. Ten minutes, use it any way you want. Leave about five minutes if you can near the end. And the questioning will come from the government side this time. We good? We're good? Okay. I'm ready. Okay, let's call back to order then. We've got the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance before us. Amir and Ryland, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Amir F. Jakarpour, and I am the president of the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance, or USA, as we very affectionately call it. We represent over 140,000 undergraduate students at seven universities in Ontario. USA advocates for a more accessible, affordable, accountable, and high-quality post-secondary uh, system in Ontario. Day to day, I'm also the vice president external at the University Students' Council at Western University, where uh, on Tuesday, actually, I will be graduating with a degree in political science. And uh, I'm Rylan Kinnan. I'm the executive director of the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance. Uh, I completed my master's in public administration at Queen's last May, and I completed my undergraduate degree uh, in 2010 at U of T, where I studied political science, philosophy, and history. I'd like to thank the committee for providing us with the opportunity to present to you today our comments on the 2013 provincial budget. Uh, we will focus on the importance of the youth job strategy and how it can be used to improve employment opportunities for post-secondary students and recent graduates. We will discuss the need for a continued focus on uh, access to post-secondary education, recognizing that expanding access to post-secondary education is the best long-term job strategy. We will also discuss the budget's commitment to addressing flat and deferral fees. And lastly, we'll discuss important priorities of students that this budget did not address. So as we said, we'd like to start by discussing uh, the youth job strategy. Students were uh, welcome the announcement of the job strategy in the 2013 budget, as it actually was one of the recommendations that we made in our 2013 pre-budget submission, which we shared with the committee in, in March, uh, unlocking student potential. Students are increasingly concerned about employment, and these concerns come in two primary forms. First of all, in terms of finding high quality work in study uh, and in the summer to help afford the costs of their post-secondary education, as well as gain meaningful experience. And of course, students are concerned about the employment opportunities that will be available to them upon graduation. Um, summer and in-study employment are the first thing we'd like to talk about today. Um, not only do they help students cover their educational costs, they can also provide students with valuable work experience that helps them uh, improve their prospects upon graduation. However, the imp impacts these experiences will have on a student's postgraduate outcome depends on the quality of the work and how related the work is to their field of study. Summer employment is a particular concern to students this year as last summer Ontario had the second worst summer on record for student unemployment. For many, this meant that they had difficulty affording their uh, post-secondary costs. And this is a particularly problematic because the Ontario Student Assistance Program assumes that every student will earn $3,000 during the summer, whether they earn $200, $2,500 or not. Um, because of this, students believe that a youth job strategy must focus on improving summer employment opportunities. Ideally, the strategy should help to incentivize employers to create more positions and more high quality positions for summer employment. One option that should be considered is to increase the value of the Ontario Summer Job Strategy wage subsidy. And we believe that by doing this, it will incentivize employers to create more positions and again, ideally higher quality positions that will improve their postgraduate employment outcomes. Uh, and summer employment is incredibly, uh, is, is vital. Uh, and also, as someone who has worked during the school year this past school year, uh, in-study employment is also incredibly important and near dear to my heart. Uh, and to address students' uh, employment needs during their study and their postgraduate outcomes, the government should make investments uh, to expand experiential learning opportunities. Experiential and work-integrated learning opportunities provide a number of benefits to students. Studies have shown that students who participate in these programs are far more likely to graduate, have more opportunities to interact with faculty on an informal basis, uh, and use wages during, earned during their work terms to fund their education. Students also benefit from experiential learning upon graduation, as it provides them with hands-on experiences and skills that employers are looking for. 
And one form of experiential learning that is particularly beneficial is cooperative education. Its value is best demonstrated by the fact that co-op grads have better post-grad earnings and employability than non-co-op grads. Much of this can be attributed to the networks that co-op grads uh, develop and the practical experience they gain in their placements. Unfortunately, in Ontario, demand for these placements far outstrips supply. And to address this issue, students recommend that the government consider using the Youth Employment Fund to improve and expand the cooperative education tax credit to incentivize the creation of more co-op placements for students. In all, uh, an investment through the Youth Employment Fund to provide more experiential learning opportunities would help the fund meet its aim of providing students with an opportunity to learn life and work skills while earning income, as well as find entry into long-term employment. And the government has also identified that one purpose of that Youth Employment Fund is to provide hiring incentives for employers to provide an entry point to that long-term uh, employment. Students are happy to see this commitment, as many students are increasingly concerned about post-grad job prospects. Students believe that the fund should provide incentives uh, to employers to both hire and train recent graduates. Unfortunately, recent reports have identified that employers are less willing to invest in training employees, and this unwillingness has had an impact on student employability. An investment of this kind will help get graduates into higher quality jobs faster, as well as encourage a shift in business behavior to once more bear some of the responsibility for training Ontario's workforce. So as we've said, students are uh, very supportive of the investment in the youth job strategy, and students believe that it has the potential to have a significant, significant impact on youth employment in this province. And we hope that it can contribute to Ontario's youth, employments in the needs, youth employment needs in the areas we have discussed today. However, students also believe that one of the best possible long-term employment strategies continues to remain investing in post-secondary education, and in particular, investing in increasing access to post-secondary education. Often in our worrying about youth unemployment, we ask what post-secondary institutions are doing incorrectly to contribute to the problem. However, what we often miss out on is that youth unemployment is actually created as well by unequal access to post-secondary education. Consider this, 28% of youth who didn't complete high school were unemployed in 2012, compared to only 11% of youth in post who had um, received a post-secondary education. This is particularly concerning given that so many marginalized populations never make it to post-secondary in Ontario. This includes lower income Ontarians, this includes Aboriginal Ontarians, this includes Ontarians with a disability, and as well first generation students whose parents did not attend post-secondary. These groups face informational and financial barriers that makes post-secondary education appear to be out of reach. Targeting investments in student financial assistance can help to increase these groups' participation in post-secondary. And in doing so, have a significant and long-lasting impact on youth employment in this province and on the province's economic health as a whole. Ontario's high university participation rate is something to be proud of, but it must be recognized that our universities are still far more populated by students with means than those without. For a society concerned with equality and economic growth, we must remain focused on ensuring that all Ontarians have access to the benefits of post-secondary education and make investments to help achieve this end. Now the budget has significant implications for students' employment both in study and after graduation. It also can make meaningful contributions to their academic and financial well-beings during study. And so on top of the commitments to uh, student employment, the government has provided more information on their intentions for the new tuition framework. Students appreciate that the budget identified the government's intention to address flat fees by coming up with a new definition of what a full course load is. Students have long advocated against flat fee billing systems, which charge students full tuition beyond a certain course threshold, no matter how many courses they actually take beyond that threshold. This threshold is as low as 60% of a full course load at schools such as U of T, and 70% at Western back home. Uh, this forces students to pay for education that they do not receive and increases costs for students who due to family or financial responsibilities or a disability may need to take a lower course load. Uh, students ask that the government require all institutions to charge tuition fees on a per credit basis. It is a more logical and simply more fair system uh, of charging that does not disadvantage students that we should be providing more, not less support to as flat fee systems do. 
and also the budget committed to creating a fairer approach to deferral fees, and in particular, ensuring that OSAP students do not pay tuition before their OSAP funding arrives. Students have long been concerned about billing methods in place at universities that lead to students who cannot pay their tuition fees by earlier and earlier deadlines being forced to pay an additional financial penalty. That penalty is to allow them to hold off on their tuition until their OSAP arrives. This is something that I've faced myself at Western, where we have the earliest tuition deadline in the province, August 3rd, a full month before OSAP comes in. Um, my peers at Western and uh, friends and peers at member schools around the province have expressed that the system should be more flexible to students' financial situations and, again, should not increase costs and penalties for students who already have the highest financial need. Students also strongly believe that all students should be able to pay their tuition on a per semester basis, recognizing that many students work throughout the year to fund their studies. So the final thing that we wanted to discuss was some of the issues we believe still need to be addressed that were not raised in the budget. When we last presented to the Standing Committee on Finance in March, uh, we discussed the issue of poor credit transfer in Ontario and the implications this has for students and the implications this has for the government. Uh, this has an access implication for students in the form of students not being able to follow a pathway that is most amenable to them and not having those pathways facilitated, but there also are cost implications for students in repeating courses and cost implications for the government as well. Our recommendations on credit transfer have no cost to the government, but will have a significant impact on this issue. Poor credit transfer is costly to students in the government for a simple reason. If a student takes a course more than once, they're paying for the same learning to take place. The government funds institutions on a per credit basis. So if that student takes the same basic course at two institutions, the government is paid twice. Uh, if poor credit transfer leads to a student taking longer to complete their degree, then the government's costs again increase because the government provides financial assistance to uh, a number of students in the province. Credit transfer improves access because some students may start in one geographic location and decide to move. Uh, they may be forced to move because of family issues. They may start at one type of institution and decide they need to move to another. And if none of that prior learning is recognized when they choose to move, then they must start again. This might mean that they don't ever complete a post-secondary credential, or it may mean they never reach the credential that they hope to achieve. That is why we recommend that the government require all universities in Ontario to accept all first and second year credits from other universities in Ontario. This will save students and the government a significant amount of money. It will help Ontario catch up to other jurisdictions, both in Canada and internationally, who have made far more progress on this issue than we have. And finally, it will significantly improve the accessibility of our post-secondary system. So we look forward to continuing to engage with the government on this issue in the months to come. Uh, so we'll conclude. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you today to speak about the importance of post-secondary education to Ontario's economy, uh, students' employment needs, and improving fairness in how we charge our students. We welcome any questions you may have. Thank, thank you. you. We've left time for maybe one question. Deepika? Okay. I just wanted to thank both of you very much for a very comprehensive, very articulate presentation. And uh, personally, I agree with a lot of what you've presented. So thank you very much. Thank you very thank much you. for having so us. Much. Thank you for coming today. And thank you for appearing early. Thank you so much. That, ladies and gentlemen, is our last delegation. We're going to adjourn, uh, any, unless there's any other business, I'm assuming there isn't. We're going to adjourn the committee until 9 a.m. on Monday, June 10th, 2013, for clause by clause consideration of Bill 65. Once again, a reminder, the deadline for amendments is tomorrow at 5 o'clock. In person. It's the the official copy, okay.